Hey, so I'm Marcus. I work with Artificial Labs and we're basically just around the corner at Bank Station. And yeah, today I'm going to introduce you to Sales.js. I assume that most of you haven't heard of it, but um, basically to give you just a quick idea, um, as the name Chess suggests, it is built on top of Node.js. And similar to Rails chess, it's Rails chess. <laughs> similar to Rails, it comes with the idea of convention over configuration. And yeah, I've read some people even call it um, the Rails on Node. Maybe that's why it rhymes. Um, but yeah, before I get into any details, what was actually the problem that we tried to solve at Artificial Labs? Well, we started with MRJS not too long ago and you know like we we saw quite quickly how awesome it is how like you know like everything just works based on on the same conventions and coming from a PHP background PHP just quickly started to feel clunky and like all this manual labor that you have to do just felt like yeah why do that and so we were looking for better solutions than this. And one that Ember, pro Ember or Ember Data um, provides as a default is fixture adapters, or basically creating a mock API. So you just, um, you just you know, you create your model in Ember, in Ember itself, and then you can just get coding with the front end itself and, and sort of like get quickly started without having to worry how exactly does my API look? You know, like is my server running? like all this, this this setup but it works fine until you go into production because then you still have to write the API and still make sure that everything integrates and this extra step just felt a little bit wrong for us and one quite obvious solution which I think you know a lot of Ember people know would, would have been obviously Rails and it would have been probably a very good solution but we still kind of felt it's, there's overhead, it wasn't built for the front end. So we thought, why not find a solution that combines the amazingness of Rails having the conventions, but sort of combining it with like a mock API, sort of like a framework that is built for the front end and it doesn't get in your way of rapidly coding the front end. And that is exactly where sales chess comes into play. And yeah, sales chess is built for the front end. Just to give you um, a little bit more of an idea of what features it has and what it provides before I'm going into a live demo. Um, yeah, the idea behind is that it is built for the front end. So no matter if you use Angular chess, MRJS or just write it for a watch app or for for your iPhone app or Android app um, that's exactly what the intention behind sales chess was and um, but on top of that it still has all the features that you would expect from any framework so it has a it has a quite um, beautiful um, ORM system so it works with any database that you would want it to work. And one really awesome feature that we have found while we worked with Sales Chess, in fact, you can even use multiple databases in one app and it hides the fact from you. So to give you an example, let's say you have a user model and the user can write posts. Then you could store the user model in the Redis, da in the Redis database. So you have you know, quick access to all the users, but then you could store all the posts the user writes in a MySQL or PostgreSQL database. And all you say, all you, all you, t all you do is you tell sales store this model in Redis, this model in in MySQL, and then it completely hides this fact from you, and you have exactly the same API, and it works as if you would store both in the same database, basically, um, from a developer's perspective. Um, so that was pretty. Um, amazing and we didn't expect this when we started when we started out originally with sales and 
Yeah, one other feature is built on Node.js. So obviously it is JavaScript. And one thing you might think, you know, it's both JavaScript, MRJS, CSJS, I can share code. It hasn't really been our experience that much so far. We, in fact, for our apps that we have so far, we actually we don't share like any templates or any models or anything because it's two completely separate projects. But one very nice thing that we found is you can use the same libraries on the front end and on the back end. So, for example, um, Moment Chess, which handles dates. So, when you work in the front end, you do some date conversion. You can immediately, like, you know, you just switch to the back end. You don't even have to, like, do a mental switch to a different language. You, tr you use the exact same API. And yeah, that just gave it much more of a smooth feeling, like, yeah, this is how it's supposed to be. And um, yeah, similarly, obviously, you know JavaScript, so you know, like learning the one helps a little bit with learning the other. And in fact, um, one of, I would, I call it freebies that we got from switching to SalesJS as our backend. Uh, one of our backend developers has seamlessly transitioned into a full stack developer because yeah, MRJS, you know, it just, it just blends backend and, f and frontend basically together. Um, and that was also very nice for us. Um, and yeah, another awesome thing since it's built on Node.js, um, I know maybe most, uh, some of you know Socket.io. So SalesJS has Socket.io built in as a default. So every API that um, is being generated just supports Socket.io slash real time out of the box. So you don't have to configure anything on the server. You just have to integrate it with Ember. And there is already a community adapter for that, which I can um, I have to link to it afterwards if anyone is interested. And yeah, then, then the core feature which made us interested in sales chess is that it auto-generates um, RESTful APIs for you. And yeah, I'm, I'm not really going to talk much about it. I'm just going to show it to you since I think this is more of an effect. Um, so at first, I'm just going to show you sales itself as it comes out of the box. So it doesn't, so the chasing it returns doesn't work with MR data as is, but I'm just going to show it to you that up, um, for now and afterwards we've written a little um, starter kit which basically integrates Ember and Sales without, um, without having to do any further setup. Um, yeah, as you know from, <coughs> if you've ever used um, the Ember CLI or I think Rails works similarly, you've got um, command line features as you would expect. Do you want the front of them again? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that works. Is that good? Bigger. Bigger. Bigger and better. <laughs> that works. Can everyone see in the back? Okay. Um, so yeah, you just write sales new test app. It just you know like scaffolds out um, everything in your test app folder. And if you're interested in the folder structure, um, yeah, in config it has all the config files. You could also render views on the server side if you want to. And you can, in fact, use handlebars with it since it's Node.js, it supports Node packages out of the box. Um, but we haven't really <laughs> used it. Um, and then in APIs where everything lies, so you, there, you have your, um, there you have your model views and controllers. Um, yeah, controllers, models. Uh, yeah, not your views, but yeah, your controllers and your models. And Let's just start the app up to show you how it works. Oh. Um, I just have to quickly change the port setting since I'm already running another server in the background. Um, blah, 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 blah. Oh, there we go. So, uh, 
So this starts up the server, and um, even has a nice um, little boat. So I've already got this open somewhere. Let's see. Um, yep, there we go. So this just um, renders its default view that it has at the beginning. And it gives you, well, let's make this a bit bigger as well. Okay, let's see. So this, this basically gives you, you know, like a quick um, introduction on how you can generate your API and how you can get started with it. So I'm just going to show you this real quick how this, how this actually looks and how this, like how this looks on a command line and how this looks in the browser. So, um, yes. So quickly just going to stop the server. Just um, here it tells you that it has created the controller and the model. And here is where the conventions come into play. So all you need is the controller file and the model file. And then sales um, has something that is called blueprints. And basically based on, on the sales blueprints, it automatically creates the routes and it automatically um, creates all, all the right functions to retur return a JSON and a GET request, to have a PUT request, to have a DELETE request, you know, like all the things that you expect from an API. And further, what I also forgot to mention, it supports uh, auto migrations, uh, which is very nice in development. So if you write your, your if you add some, um, some attributes to your model, you just write sales lift and it automatically populates the database. Um, with those attributes and right now if you just start the server it will actually ask me about that fact if I want to use automigrate or if I don't want to do that because in production you shouldn't um, use automigrate otherwise you might lose data um, so actually uh, let's do alter and as a default sales uses their own um, database adapter which is, you can compare it to SQLite, it just stores a file on a database, but it works a bit like MongoDB. You don't have to define any, any attributes or anything, it just stores everything in there um, that you send to it. So if you now go, um, this here, yep. Uh, Localhost, yeah, I love playing around with ports. Um, slash user, you just see the empty JSON response since we have nothing in there. And um, what sales does as well, it, it gives you for, for development purposes, um, it provides you with a route that you can just create um, new models in the browser very easily. And um, yeah, let's just use the same thing that I've done beforehand. And here you just see like the response. So every model automatically has a created ad, an updated ad field. You don't have to um, do anything for that. Um, let's just add a second one. Um, yeah, there we go. Whoops, that is not what I wanted to do. Uh, so, and if we now go back to our user route, you will see that there is, uh, yeah, you see that they're both are in the database. And you could just, you know, switch it out, out with MongoDB or PostgreSQL or whatever, and it would store it in an actual uh, database. So now, if you've worked with Ember data before, you can see that this doesn't work with Ember chess, so the JSON structure looks a little bit different, and also the, the URL is a little bit different. So for that, there is two nice community projects. Um, one is called Sales Ember Blueprints, which basically is the idea it modifies the server. So it returns the JSON exactly in the way that Ember data expects it. Or the other way is doing it on the front end. There is a Sales um, Ember Data Adapter, uh, which you don't have to modify anything in the server, and Ember data just you know, converts it the way it wants it to have. And this Ember data sales adapter also comes with a socket I.O. adapter, so um, there's also the real-time functionality built into, into Ember. So we at, um, have created a little starter kit, which 
you can access and play around with if you want to. So we've chosen the route of modifying the, the sales server to give us the JSON that Ember Data expects um, with its default REST adapter. And just to give you a little introduction into the, the, the folder structure. So you've got the server. This is just what I've scaffolded out beforehand. Um, just the only thing different is you can see here there's a blueprints folder. And this basically overrides sales chest defaults with whatever defaults you want it to override. And then we've got the client folder. So we've taken the approach of treating for developments, treating the client, this, this, the Ember client, completely separate from the server. So we've got, we've got the amazing features of using Ember CLI. And this is just a scaffolded out project from Ember CLI. So you will see in a second, I will um, fire up the server. And so during development, it basically treats the sales chest server as a third party server. So at least in development, you need to have um, course enabled, like cross uh, whatever it's called, um, just, <laughs> you know, you have synonyms <laughs> um, <laughs> or acronyms or whatever the word is. Um, but then obviously for, for actual production, you would just build the app, Ember build, and uh, then right now, and then basically serve it through the sales, um, sales chess server. So right now, this is the major weakness still with our app, uh, with our starter kits. Right now, you have to manually copy over the, the, the distance, you know, trap, drop it in the, in the S in sales chest assets folder. But um, yeah, we, we're working on, on automating that step as well. So this feels a bit better. Um, yeah, so to show it in action. Uh, there we go. I've created a little demo. So um, here we are just, so this is basically, uh, let's just show it real quick. So here you just see that is basically Ember starter kit just um, um, cloned down like as it is. The only thing that I've done on the front end, I've, I've basically coded a, a quick front end, but the server is exactly as it is if you would just do a clone so there doesn't exist any, any model, any controller or anything. Um, so in this demo, I basically want to show you like you have a front end, but you don't have a back end, and all you need to do is one write one command, and you can just you know like um, have the front end work together with the back end. Um, so here we've got the client. We just run an Ember server. This fires up the um, the server. Ignore the JS hint. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we've got this running on localhost 4200 and yeah, we've got, it's just a simple sign up page basically. And so if you now just create a user, um, Tomster1234 and click register, it says not found because there's just an error from the server. I'm just here. I'm just returning the default errors. I haven't even looked into creating any nice error messages or anything. But um, to get this working, you go back to the sales server, and all you have to write is sales generate API surgeon. We call our model um, surgeon. But um, the one thing that is wrong here. This URL just uses the default URL, but you can actually change in the config to pluralize it, and you can also give it a namespace. So the URL would actually be um, slash API slash v1 slash search ends, which um, is what Ember Data expects if you also give it a name, the same namespace. So if you now register, um, should work. Oh, yeah, starting the server. That is clever. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And we're logged into the dashboard. Amazing. Um, but just to show you that it actually is stored on the server, let's just go quick on, on the server itself. And if you just go to 
Um, op, 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 API, we want you, uh, no, assertions, we don't want users, assertions. Um, there's just some test data that I um, created beforehand. You see here that indeed we've just created um, Tomster with a password of 1234. <laughs> Very <laughs> secure. <laughs> Um, that's what we want from, from <laughs> production-ready applications. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, um, that is basically, it just, yeah, manages to sort of like get out of your way to just let you get started with developing your front end straight away and actually have a back end that you can very easily get into production. All you have to do is fill in the right attributes in your model file. And, um, yeah, that's about it. So, um, get back to the presentation. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, so, yeah, here again you see the, the URLs to the resources. So, the first one is our starter kit, which you can just clone to get started right away. Then, the second one is the one that we're using for our starter kits to just integrate sales with Ember. And the second one is what I've mentioned before. It's if you rather prefer to have, you know, like, um, the front end um, adhere to the server, um, or if you if you want to look into how to get Socket.io working with sales chest, this is probably also a very good starting point since it already does it for you. Um, but yeah, what's what um, is still planned for the future? So sales chest is compared to other frameworks like Rails or even some PHP frameworks, relatively new and um, hence not as mature. But especially over the last half year or so, the user base has been growing. And yeah, there have been some, some pretty amazing people doing some um, pretty amazing work. And you can really see, I almost feel like this is sort of like Ember, like before, like when it was in re release candidates days or like when it was just about 1.0 times where people really started to get interested in it and really started to contribute to it. And yeah, so there is, there is lots of different libraries that are coming. And yeah, we, as I said, we ourselves want to work on, on even better integration of sales and MRJS. Um, we are planning on sending a, a, a pull request to sales to just give it a default command that you can just can just tell them like, hey, when you create a new project, you know, like create it in in JSON API format, as Ember expects. So you don't even need like any custom adapter or anything anymore. Um, and obviously, automating the process of of compiling or building your app and serving it through the sales chest server. Um, that is the next big thing. <laughs> or, yeah. Just to sum it up again, um, yeah, sales embraces con um, conventions as you're used to from Emergest or if you've used Rails before. It does all the, the work of creating the REST API for you and hence it's just perfect to just yeah, get code as quickly and just you know, get your app working. And yeah, if you use our starter kit, it plays very nicely with Ember. So, um, yeah, that's, that's about it. And if you want to have access to this presentation, it's available through this URL. And, um, yeah, if you, if you still have any questions afterwards or you want to see about our experience putting an app into production with that stack, you can just um, talk to me afterwards or send me an email or send me a message on Twitter. And also, if you found any of that stuff exciting, we're always looking for developers. Just, again, come talk to me or um, shoot us an email. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Any questions? Are we seeing the death of the back-end developer? <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good question. No, I, I wouldn't say so. 
there, I think there's still various use cases, I mean, very important things <laughs> for, I mean, wasn't the right choice of words maybe, but still very important things for the, I, what, I, what, I, what I really like about the backend, you have it under control, you know on what server you're putting it, and you don't know, you know, like what the client is doing, like what phone does he have, what server does he have, and so I think there's always, you know, you always need a server to do, you know, like some grunt work to, you know, like do powerful calculations. Or in our app, we we actually use Phantom Chess for PDF rendering. So we just created um, basically our PDF with handlebars and and CSS and all that stuff, and then just used Phantom Chess to take a screenshot and and render it as a PDF. And you don't really want to do that on the front end because, yeah, if someone comes with an on Android, then five-year-old Android on your maybe not five year old, but two year old Android would probably take like five minutes or something. But I feel more it's, I see it more as like a harmony sort of. Like, yeah, as, as we saw, like it's, there's no barrier anymore between, or much um, smaller barrier between backend and front end. It's almost if you can do the one, it's very easy to, to, to get to the other. Um, yeah, that's, that's the way I see it. Any other questions? I guess in terms of further work, could you see like something like automatic model generation on both back end, front end, one command? Yeah, that would be something really cool. I've I've actually been thinking about that. Yeah, that is that would probably be a sort of like an easier solution. What I'm wondering, or what I would find really cool is if you sort of have just one file. And then you can sort of define if you want the things on the server or on the client or in both. Because in some cases you trust, you know, you don't want your front end, you know, to have certain certain secure um, secure data. But um, I think that would still be a long way to go to just have like one file. But I think that is a very um, good idea, and I might put this on our our sort of like to do list. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean that's definitely possible. You just um, you need to write a gen you know, some kind of generator. But um, yeah, very good idea. <laughs> yeah. What's your reason for choosing the, um, like in terms of the end of data adapter versus the back end yeah. thing? What was your thought process there? Yeah, that was, again, sort of what I said before. I kind of liked the feeling of having things on more under control. And I mean, I know that. If you use a third party API, you have to do, you know, like modify the Ember data standard on the front end. But I kind of feel if I can do it on the back end and just let Ember use its default, I sort of, you know, like have it on my server and have it more under control. It's, I, th I don't think there's really a logical reason, a big logical reason behind it, but that's sort of just um, how, I, how I personally see it. And I, I don't think there is. One is, you know, like much better than the other. Uh, more like a matter of preference. I guess the only one thing is. Now it's very easy to create a pull request to sales. Just tell them, um, you know, like just use the, you know, give this option to use these blueprints, and then you don't even have to do anything anymore. Um, that might be the only thing. But apart from that, um, there isn't any preference really. Anything else? Did you drop the um, proxy option on the server rather Yeah, I, I actually saw that. And I was like, I could use that, but then I have to learn something new. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to admit it was pure laziness that I didn't look into that. And I was like, I know how course works. I know that I can. But yeah, I've, I've seen that. And when I have some free time at some point, I might try to implement that or look into that, how this compares. But um, yeah, it was just out of pure um, laziness reasons. <laughs> so there are reasons. And also because, yeah, I mean, all you have to make sure that, I mean, for the app that we, that we put into production, the only thing that we had to make sure, since you know, it's only an internal API, that we set course to false, like when you put in production, so that you, know, like, that you can't just do a, a, a post request from another server, which you know, is just a simple environment setting. Any other questions?